Our second session uh, will be presented by Nicholas Dumovich. Uh, Nick has turned out to be just a great friend of this university. He's come out several times and, and uh, given talks about the agency and the work of intelligence. He, he has a good friend, Richard Davis, who teaches in our political science department that is fortunate enough to get Nicholas out once in a while. So we, we really love his visits and appreciate his support of our efforts here. Um, Nicholas is with the CIA uh, historical staff. Uh, he started there in 1990 as an analyst and has also served as speechwriter to John Deutsch and George Tennant, former CIA directors. And also he was an editor of the one of the more important intelligence products. We, we all call it the PDB, but it's the President's Daily Brief. I might add here that about uh, when did Charles Lathup publish his book? 2004. In 2004, a magnificent book for intelligence scholars was published by Yale University Press called um, uh, "The Liter uh, A or the? the The Literary Spy," and it's just full—a thick book of wonderful quotations, broken down into categories about intelligence and. Uh, I, I, I was just a voracious reader of the book, and I was, I was telling Nicholas once that I think the last three or four articles I've had published, I've used material from that book. And Nicholas said to me at the time, well, don't tell anyone, but I wrote it, because the editor is called Charles Lathrop. Uh, so Nicholas had reasons to maintain his, uh, to cover his identity when he first published that, but I am not violating any confidentiality because he has come out and out from out from the cold since then and admitted that he published that wonderful book. Um, prior to his agency career, Nicholas was a seagoing officer at the U.S. Coast Guard, taught at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. He received a bachelor's degree in government from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and a Ph.D. Fred from that most uh, famous of all graduate schools, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. <laughs> So now we have a trio for the school song. Nicholas, we're grateful to have you here, and he will speak to us about Hollywood. Don't you go disrespecting my culture. Thank you. It's always a pleasure being at, uh, at BYU. Um, I found myself, when listening to Dr. Locke Johnson, agreeing with him uh, so violently that I developed a crick in my neck. Uh, so a lot of the themes that um, I will speak on, uh, you've heard before. Sometimes at conferences it's useful for the second uh, speaker to take it in another direction. Uh, if that's your hopes, I'm going to disappoint you. Uh, you'll hear much the same, but I think in a new way because we're going to focus on, uh, on just one movie. Um, as Stan said, and thank you for that introduction, uh, I'm a staff historian at the Central Intelligence Agency, and I have to say uh, right at the outset that uh, what I say is m my own opinion. Uh, it definitely should not be considered an official pronouncement or release on the part of the agency. Um, so what does a CIA staff historian do? We do not watch a lot of films. Uh, <laughs> but in the case of Robert De Niro's film, The Good Shepherd, I personally had to make an exception. Uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to comment on it uh, from a historian's perspective and from a, an inside CIA perspective. Um, what I have to say will make more sense, obviously, if you've seen the movie, um, but I think even if you haven't, and if, especially if you value the, uh, if you appreciate the value of good history and good storytelling, uh, my remarks uh, may be useful. Uh, my talk is in three parts. Uh, the first is really a thought experiment that speculates on how Hollywood would treat a particular historical reality that I will relate. The second part is uh, the main part, how Hollywood actually deals with historical reality, using the example of the Good Shepherd. And third, I'll comment on how Hollywood ought to deal with historical reality. <coughs> first, the thought experiment. It deals with a um, a very real part of the agency's history, the A-12 spy plane. Now, everybody's heard of the U-2, and everybody has heard of the SR-71 Blackbird, but fewer people have heard of the A-12. It's on my mind because we're acquiring an A-12 for display at the agency 
uh, later this year. Um, everybody's heard of the SR-71 Blackbird, that sleek, Cobra-like, black, supersonic Mach 3 aircraft developed in the 1960s, uh, and yet it is alleged still holds uh, the world's speed and altitude records for a piloted air-breathing um, aircraft, except that it doesn't. The less famous A-12 uh, was, actually it has that honor. It was developed before the SR-71 Blackbird. We in CIA like to say that uh, what one CIA pilot could do, they had, they had to have two Air Force people doing, because they put a second person uh, in the Air Force version uh, of the A-12, lengthened it by five feet, uh, gave it a different sensor package, and so forth. But the SR-71, the Blackbird, is actually a slightly slower, slightly lower flying version of the A-12. I like to champion the A-12, obviously. Uh, it was a CIA-sponsored project of the Lockheed Corporation, uh, which had developed the U-2, and uh, once built and tested, the A-12 uh, was a CIA-controlled and operated uh, and piloted program. Uh, the A-12 was deployed operationally, had a very short operational life, and the first operational miss mission was on the 31st of May, 1967. There are a couple different versions of what happened on that mission. In one version, and you find this in very respectable history, uh, uh, aviation history books, is that uh, this mission was over North Vietnam to photograph surface air missile sites, SAM sites. In this version, the North Vietnamese almost immediately detected the A-12 and sent up as many as two dozen SAMs, a very dangerous situation that the A-12 and its pilot were lucky to survive. This near miss uh, created, so the story goes, a great consternation in Washington because the A-12 had been designed to evade detection and to be so high and so fast that it would avoid any countermeasures if it happened to be detected. Now, the other version of the story about this operational mission on the 31st of May, 1967, a version you will also find in other history books. Uh, it's not just a little different, it's completely different. Uh, in this version, the A-12 entered and exited North Vietnamese airspace without being detected at all and then came back a for a run through the DMZ. It photographed dozens of SAM sites. Far from being an intelligence failure, the, m the mission in this version of history was a complete success. The bird flew exactly as designed. It was an intelligence triumph, or so this version of the story goes. They both can't be true. So which is it? I'm not going to say. <laughs> because my point is that if you're a Hollywood filmmaker, the truth doesn't matter. Say you're doing a version of the right stuff dealing with the A-12. Um, which story of the A-12's fir first operational mission are you going to tell? Is there any doubt that you will tell the more exciting version? The version where the A-12 is almost knocked out of the sky? The version that practically invites you to make pointed political and social commentary on America's hubristic war against the North Vietnamese? Uh, together with the failure of American technological prowess, is there any question that you, Mr. Hollywood Director or Miss Hollywood Director, will not really care what the truth is about, chasing after the, uh, the box office, as uh, Dr. Johnson said in the last presentation? Is there any doubt that, for good measure, you might even uh, label this, you know, based on a true story? Because this is the lesson of the Good Shepherd. Hollywood arrogates to itself the right to tell us what history is all about. And I think that's a real problem. It seems rather foolish now, but I confess it, it was with great anticipation that we on the history staff awaited uh, the release of The Good Shepherd. We had heard that De Niro had been working on this film for eight years, which in retrospect is really too bad for him, uh, that he had a former agency officer as a consultant, that the film was going to address the agency's early history, hadn't been done, uh, that it was going to have a main character at least partly based on uh, James Angleton, a very interesting figure to say the least, um, that he, the legendary and controversial uh, chief of CIA counterintelligence. All this we saw really as a potentially good thing. There haven't been a lot of movies about U.S. intelligence history, 
And if done fairly, uh, we thought the Good Shepherd could help illuminate that history, warts and all. We know that a fair treatment of the agency's history would be a mixed bag. There were successes, there were failures. Real life is like that. Uh, and there are some amazingly interesting characters behind both the successes and the failures. In my um, naivete, I even had delusions that we'd be, be able to praise it. A couple of months before the film opened, I was listening to national public radio, and uh, there was, they were commenting on the Clint Eastwood film, The Flags of Our Fathers, which was released um, before uh, last fall, before uh, The Good Shepherd. During that broadcast, I heard the chief historian of the United States Marine Corps commenting very positively on this film. And I remember thinking, we could do that. We should do that for The Good Shepherd. And it will add to the public's knowledge about what CIA is about. About that time, a colleague of mine pointed out, and he was right about this, when Clint Eastwood makes a film about the Marines at Iwo Jima, he's trying hard to get it right. Big things and small things. By contrast, it's hard to think about, uh, hard to think of a, a single film about CIA that really tries hard to get things right. Um, the Good Shepherd gets almost nothing right. Uh, there is a tendentiousness throughout the film, from the title to the closing credits, uh, in many historical distortions that convince me that its makers were not interested in getting things right. Even worse, um, is that they want you to believe that they did get it right. That this is reality, this is history, this is the untold story as the film's promotion uh, proclaims. And uh, this is the unforgivable sin. Saying it's the truth when it's not, and they know it's not. Now before I get specific about the film's many uh, shortcomings, I have to say that I would love to ignore this film uh, because I really do have better things to do. Uh, but I can't. As an agency historian, I, I do have to deal with this film and the damage it does. We teach courses uh, within the agency, classified courses to a cleared audience, and uh, we always get questions about it. People don't know. They want to know what is the truth and what is uh, not. Uh, usually in, in any given um, uh, set, set historical session that we give, uh, about half the people have seen it. Many of them have questions about what is real, what isn't, and they're shocked to hear that essentially there is nothing in the film you can rely on. Now, to my mind, there are a couple general approaches one can take in presenting history, uh, and the Good Shepherd botched both of them. Uh, the first approach is straight historical. We're all familiar with the documentary or quasi-documentary approach from the body of facts that generally are accepted. You tell the story, the historical story, as faithfully as you can. Admittedly, this can be deadly dull, uh, whether you're reading uh, a poorly written um, history book or watching a dull documentary. Even so, shouldn't we be biased towards the truth? Um, but fortunately, real history can be compelling, moving, and dramatic as anything, uh, as the point has been made, uh, dramatic as anything in, uh, that you'll find in fiction, particularly if you get talented actors. The best example I can think of in film, and there are many others, uh, is Torah, Torah, Torah. You know what's going to happen. No matter how many times you see it, the Japanese still bomb Pearl Harbor. Um, but even so, it's incredibly exciting how the drama unfolds. And if you have read Gordon Prong's definitive uh, work on the history uh, at Dawn We Slept, you know that the filmmaker, filmmakers really made the film hew very closely to the history. So Hollywood can do the right thing by history when it wants to. Now, faithfulness to the historical record does impose certain constraints. Um, I mean, you can sift through alternative theories, uh, competing, uh, try to reconcile competing interpretations, but basically you as the artist are somewhat constrained in your options. You can't tell just any story you want because the history more or less you know, defines the boundaries. The other general approach to telling the story of history is a literary one where you have more options in the storytelling. And this is more like uh, the, the metaphor is used, more like painting a portrait than snapping a photograph. And historians often don't like to admit it, but there can be profound historical truth in fiction. Um, I think Larry in the panel mentioned uh, the killer angels made into the movie Gettysburg. It's a novel about 
um, the Battle of Gettysburg, and it's taught and recommended by the U.S. Army. Uh, Boris Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago, uh, a novel of made-up characters uh, dealing with the Russian Revolution and Civil War. Uh, Solzhenitsyn's One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. This presents in literary form a slice of the historical reality of the gulag through the eyes of one fictional character over the course of one fictional day. Now, we all know examples like these, and we all know, or should know, that it has to be done with respect for the truth. You can't have Robert E. Lee drunk at Gettysburg, and you can't have him victorious either, much as you might want that. You can't have Ivan Denisovich, you know, watching some TV, going for a workout in the gym before writing his column for the prison newspaper. It doesn't work. You have to remain true to the truth, even if you're making up characters, scenarios, chronologies, and events. Now, if one deviates from truth in storytelling, then it's another thing altogether. It's fantasy, like Three Days of the Condor, uh, Mission Impossible, The Bourne Supremacy. And if you do that, you can't really insist, then, that your art reflects reality. There's nothing wrong with innocent fantasy. Um, I like to use the analogy that I'm sure physicists enjoy watching Star Trek. Uh, they know it's bunk, but they can enjoy it. Um, I personally enjoy the literature of alternative histories, where Lee is victorious at <laughs> Gettysburg, you know, where the Axis wins World War II, or my personal favorite, uh, the American colonies lose their war for independence. Uh, which I used to uh, tell uh, at the Coast Guard Academy to a horrified history class. Um, the Good Shepherd fails both of these major tests. It's lousy history, to be sure, but even worse, it's false storytelling, dressed up as, this is what really happened. Uh, now, the historical liberties of the film uh, are beyond counting. <laughs> Actually, I, I know because I stopped counting, uh, and certainly be beyond the time that we have. Let me just cover the three most egregious examples, uh, but more importantly demonstrate how the historical distortions in them underlie the distorted story that the filmmakers want to present. The film shows the origins of CIA uh, rightly in the World War II agency, the Office of Strategic Services, which learned the intelligence business from the British, largely. Fair enough. But the film makes a caricature of the relationship between OSS and our British cousins. Uh, the thesis is that we learn not only the intelligence profession from the British, but we embraced its dark and corrupting nature. For example, in order to support the premise that CIA from the beginning was a ruthless organization, which is the entire backbone of the film, the film essentially lies about wartime British intelligence because we learn from them. A respected senior officer in the British service is brutally beaten and murdered on a public street by his own service because of some security indiscretions, which unfortunately uh, the British were known to ignore later on. Um, this is ahistorical and tendentious. And to get the main character there, the OSS guy, in London during the Blitz, they had to create OSS a year before it actually existed. My second major objection to the film's portrayal of history, and it's actually the worst part of a bad film, uh, concerns the two Soviet defectors, both claiming to be a guy named Mironov. The first defector has gained CIA's trust, so he is believed. The second defector, claiming to be Mironov, uh, we want to find out who he really is. So in the film, he is beaten, drugged with LSD, and even waterboarded uh, to get him to admit his real identity. That defector then jumps out a window to his death while CIA interrogators stand around and wonder what happened. It's an ugly, ugly scene. Now, in history, there were two Soviet defectors. They did not claim to be the same guy. But in general, the first one's testimony was believed while the second defector's contradictory testimony was not believed. And that's where the resemblance to reality ends. The real second defector's name was Nasenko. And it's important to know that he defected not in the 1950s, as shown in the film, but shortly after the Kennedy assassination. Now think of it. This is a time when we needed to know all he knew about 
possible Soviet involvement in the assassination of a U.S. president. The stakes could not have been higher in reality, certainly higher than shown in the film. You could not have a more volatile situation where we really needed to know the truth. Now, Nosenko was treated poorly. It's on the record. But the hostile interrogations he was subjected to did not include, as portrayed in the film, physical violence. He was never given drugs. There certainly was no waterboarding. Uh, with all the, incentive, all the incentive in the world to take this man apart, CI officers did not. And this is documented. I would offer that they knew that it would be wrong. Now, that interrogation scene in the movie is clearly a commentary not on the history it purports to depict, but on very recent events. Uh, and I believe it's politically motivated. In other words, we've been had. Uh, in terms of the film's injustices to the men and women of CIA, that scene is really the worst. Uh, the, third, the third big lie of The Good Shepherd is this utterly bizarre running thesis that the agency is merely an extension of the Skull and Bone Society of Harvard, of, sorry, Yale University. Uh, an alleged brotherhood more concerned about their own interests than they are about anything else, family, country, the law, certainly morality. The reality, as with the A-12 story I related, is not just a little different, it's completely different. Most senior, most senior CIA officers during this period had not even gone to Yale and of those that did, not one, not one, was a member of Skull and Bones. Uh, you have a uh, handout that I, uh, you can see some of the details of this. The Alan Dulles character in the film is portrayed as a Skull and Bones hierarch. Well, Alan Dulles went to Princeton. The Richard Helms character is a Skull and Bones brother. Helms went to Williams, and he was temperamentally unsuited for that kind of nonsense anyway. Uh, the main characters, played, uh, played by Matt Damon, is an amalgam of James Angleton and Richard Bissell, both of whom went to Yale, neither of whom was Skull and Bones. Bissell was invited and thought it was silly and didn't accept. Um, the conclusion one easily draws is that this is a commentary on the Bush family. Now, those are just a few examples of how the makers of The Good Shepherd decided on deliberate distortions of history to tell the story they wanted to tell. I could relate many more. Now, as a historian, I would prefer the strict, you know, chronological literary, uh, sorry, the historical approach, the documentary approach. But I could accept deviations from that if in the storytelling, the truth is told about the atmosphere of the times, the challenges that people faced, um, how they overcome obstacles and how, or were defeated by them. Um, I, I look particularly like the film Master and Commander, which is based on the novels of Patrick O'Brien. Made up characters, made up ships, loosely based on real events, but very loosely. And yet you get a real good sense of what naval warfare was like in the early 19th century. Uh, in The Good Shepherd, however, every conflation, rearranged chronology, anachronism, or wholly invented event serves a purpose, does not serve the purpose of truth in storytelling, but a false purpose, the proposition that intelligence is a fundamentally dark, humorless profession conducted by cynical, corrupt, and ruthless people for whom the ends justify any means whatsoever, and that during the Cold War it didn't matter anyway because uh, it was all a wasted effort, as the second defector says, uh, Soviet uh, military might is just painted the rust. Um, the cynicism of the movie starts with the title, which of course evokes the good shepherd of the Christian gospel, who was wi willing to lay down his life for his sheep, but in the film there was no good shepherd of this sort at all. The theme is betrayal, deception. You can't trust anyone. Intelligence work is a dirty business. It turns people who work in CIA into monsters, like the Angleton character. By working in CIA, you lose your soul. In reality, keeping secrets actually bolsters the sense that you have to trust others. It actually fosters comradeship. There is a sense of community in CIA culture and history that is belied by the film's dog-eat-dog -dog atmosphere. What the filmmakers have done is take one aspect of one officer's life, um, James Angleton. 
definitely a suspicious and aloof man later in his life, maybe clinically par paranoid, some have thought so. They've taken this aspect of one real officer's life and worked it backwards throughout his entire life and then expanded it horizontally to include everybody else, everybody in CIA, the whole institution. This is bre breathtakingly dishonest. You end up with a CIA leadership that is cold and bloodless, unemotional, stoic, inhuman, humorless, and quite frankly, not very likable, boring. As anyone knows who has looked at CIA during this period, this is quite at odds uh, with the CIA elite at the time who were very temperamental and emotional, real characters who told jokes, you know, pounded the table, worked and played hard, believed in their work and in their country and its values. Now, speaking of the characters, uh, I would uh, offer the matrix uh, that shows uh, the characters of the film along with the real life figures that they are based on. It is very telling to me that the most human person in The Good Shepherd, the most likable person, the one guy you might want to get to know, is the Soviet. That is just bizarre. But worse than that, the, he's the Soviet spy master who has no basis in reality. In this film, the most real character has the least real basis. That says something about what the filmmakers were trying to do. Thomas Powers, in one of his many intelligent essays about intelligence, says that we are not always going to know all the facts of intelligence history, but we can certainly know what it was like. The Good Shepherd does not tell us what it was like. And yet the Good Shepherd goes to great lengths to make you believe that this is the untold story, the hidden history of CIA. Now the attention to detail and the costuming and the props is amazing. And to my eye, looks very accurate. It makes you think like you're watching a quality documentary of the kind that the British are so good at. The film's website, which I encourage you to visit, uh, tries to enhance the historical veracity of this film by citing um, various published works, books of history, that it claims support the message of the movie. Uh, two of the better works cited, uh, and I recommend them both, are The Very Best Men by Evan Thomas, a critical treatment of CIA's leadership during the 1950s, and Tom Mangold's devastating work on James Angleton, Cold Warrior. Both works are very critical, and the history staff recommends them both. Um, I'm not surprised in the least that both these authors, Evan Thomas and Tom Mangold, have publicly distanced themselves from this film because of the historical howlers on the one hand and because of the dark tone it portrays, which is at variance with the CIA that they researched and wrote about, so you don't have to take my word for it. As uh, Dr. Johnson said in his presentation, you know, the real history ought to be good enough. The real history with the real characters, an honest treatment of the Bay of Pigs, as it really happened, would be replete with the classic elements of hope, hubris, and human failure. From, from Hollywood's perspective, what's not to like? Even an honest treatment of James Angleton and some of the other historical CIA figures, Frank Wisner, Richard Bissell, Bill Harvey's been mentioned, uh, Alan Dulles and Richard Helms, I think this would make moviegoers happy because these guys, with all their aspirations and talents and quirks, were profoundly interesting people. There are many, many real CIA stories from the period covered by The Good Shepherd that would make wonderful movies. That should address the um, problem that Dr. Johnson uh, mentioned, that they're mostly interested in uh, you know, the box office numbers and uh, what's that phrase? They, they don't care to uh, come close to the shores of reality. Uh, I like that. Um, we should despair of ever seeing these real stories being made by Hollywood because the agency in real life doesn't match the monster model uh, that Hollywood would prefer. I would like to see a Hollywood film done uh, with respect for historical truth about the Berlin Tunnel in 1955, the development of the, a, uh, the U-2 or the A-12 spy planes. The Iran covert action has been mentioned, um, and also, as I said, the, the Bay of Pigs. In my time remaining, I want to discuss another example from that period, and it's personally my favorite CIA story. I wrote a classified treatment of it um, 
and an unclassified version has uh, recently appeared in Studies in Intelligence. Just briefly, this is the commercial for Studies in Intelligence, our quarterly in-house journal uh, that now appears in an unclassified edition twice a year. Uh, you can see it on CIA.gov. It's a great resource for scholars and students. I commend it to you. Now let me tell this story by describing a Hollywood movie you'll never see. Even though this story concerns the extremes of the human condition, including utter disaster and despair, endurance and survival, uh, survival against all odds, and ultimately redemption and even joy. Um, I'm reminded that uh, Ken Ringel, who's a, a writer and literary critic for the Washington Post, he wrote recently that literature to be great needs to have one of mankind's great literary themes. And he listed those as man versus God or fate, man versus nature, man versus society or government, man versus man, man versus woman, uh, man versus himself. All great literature can be boiled down to at least one of those great literary themes, and I believe this CIA story has all six. And it has the additional advantage of being true. As I said earlier, we should have a bias for the truth. So the film opens showing uh, two bright and energetic young men, Richard Fecto and John Downey, who are just graduating from college in 1951. Dick Fecto is a little uh, older than, uh, than uh, Downey. Uh, Dick is newly married, father of twin uh, two-year-old girls from a previous marriage. He's from a working class family uh, in Lynn, Massachusetts. He graduates from Boston University. Jack Downey is also a New Englander from Connecticut, graduating from Yale. Both men are intelligent, both are athletic. They both uh, play on their varsity uh, football teams. Um, and each one of them has a noted sense of humor, according to the CIA recruiters who talk to them. Both men are patriotic and want to serve their country, and they were born too late to serve in World War II. Now, however, the United States is at war in Korea, and it's in a Cold War with communism. They both enter CIA. Jack Downey first in June of 1951, Dick Fecto a few months later. Both men are full of life and energy. Their future is full of promise. Jack goes out to the Far East in 1951. Now, he's assigned to a CIA unit in the Far East. I, I may not name or locate it, but it's important only to know that he's close to the action. He's only 21, but even so, his leadership ability is noted. He gets involved in training and preparing anti-communist ethnic Chinese agent teams who will be sent into communist China to link up with dissidents, to send back intelligence on Chinese communist activities and strength, and possibly to begin sabotage operations all with the uh, overall goal of diverting communist Chinese resources from the war in Korea. This is heady stuff for such a young man, but he thrives on the challenge and the newness of it all. At his small base, where CIA is preparing and mounting operations against communist China, Jack trains and gets to know one particular team very well, knowing that they are heading into danger and might not come back. When all is ready, the agents Jack has trained are airdropped into northwest China, into Manchuria. This is the summer of 1952. He's relieved when they make radio contact and they report back over several months. There are several successful resupply flights uh, into this uh, denied area. So apparently Jack's team has eluded the communist Chinese security forces. In the fall, the team in Manchuria radios back that they have made contact with dissidents, they have important documents to pass back. One of the team members is a courier who has been trained specifically for an aerial extraction. And at the time, what they did is the man to be extracted would wear a harness on his body. This harness was tied to a line, which then was strung between two tall upright poles. And then a fixed wing aircraft would come by, hook the line, pulling up the line and the harness with the man in it. And then the two guys in the back would winch him in. Hard stopping stuff. Uh, but they were trained to do that, um, and it's this courier that requests this form of aerial extraction. So this is set up for a night in late November 1952. Meanwhile, three things are happening that drive this drama. First, one of the young CIA officers uh, at this CIA facility, uh, a colleague of Jack Downey's, he studies the radio transmissions from the team, 
And he notices that there's something wrong. This is the day of Morse code, right? The pattern of transmission, the so-called operator's fist, has changed, or so he thinks. He takes his concern to the CIA unit chief, the boss for Jack and Dick and, and this uh, young officer. This is a man very interested in the success of this mission. And the CIA chief tells him, no, nah, it's not enough. Forget it. It's nothing. The young man presses his case, and the senior has him transferred to another unit. Hollywood loves it when the U.S. government, especially CIA, shows this kind of hubris. The second thing that's happening is that the uh, facility gets a new man. This is Dick Fecto, fresh from his training. He's told to read in on all the operational files. Uh, so in addition to his regular duties, training, ethnic uh, Chinese agents, he spends two or three days, uh, th two or three hours a day looking at the operational files. Third, this uh, unit chief, the CIA chief, he's already made one grave error in discounting evidence that something might have gone wrong with the team, and he makes another bad decision. The chief needs to have two men in the back of the aircraft to make the snatch. Um, the pilots in the aircraft are from the Civil Air Transport, a CIA proprietary airline, uh, Civil Air Transport known as CAT. They've got CAT people who can do the air crew duties in the back to be the winchmen. But the CIA chief says they don't have the clearances for a mission, uh, an operational flight over mainland China, this denied area. So he signs Jack Downey and this new guy, Dick Fecto, to do the job. In other words, to fix a relatively small security problem, a lack of clearances, the chief comes up with a solution that has staff officers with detailed knowledge of operations, bases, personnel, flying over communist, uh, the communist Chinese mainland on a covert mission, which is a rather huge security problem. Hollywood loves it when government types, especially CIA, make big mistakes. The bigger, the better. Now, at this point, the movie depicts a cold, quiet night uh, in late November, somewhere on the Korean Peninsula. You see an olive drab C-47 take off. The moon is full. Visibility is excellent. In the cockpit, you have cat pilots, Schwartz and Snotty, uh, the very best of cat when cat employed the best pilots. Uh, in the cold back of the aircraft are two young men. Dick and Jack joke a bit, but otherwise are quiet for the three-hour flight, probably thinking over the next weekend fling in Tokyo, uh, or about their families. There's no indication that this is anything but a quick in-and-out mission. Arriving at the pickup zone, they've crossed into mainland China, over mainland China. They see the team signal, uh, a line of three bonfires and a blinking flashlight. Dick and Jack, on the first run, they kick out supplies for the team. Then on the second pass, that's a dry run for the man in the harness. They can see him, the courier, uh, on the ground. It's a snowy landscape. Then on the third and final pass, which is the pickup pass, C-47 is flying very low for the snatch and very slow, almost at stall speed, which is about 60 miles an hour. A perfect target at the snatch point. White sheets fly off the machine gun mounts that have been hidden along the plane's path. And the communist Chinese open fire, targeting the cockpit and killing pilots Schwartz and Snotty. The team on the ground, you see, had been caught by the communists very early on in the mission. They had been turned or doubled. The request for exfiltration was a ruse. The promised documents were bait. And CIA fell for it. Hollywood should love it. Uh, the pilots, even as they died, manage to keep the nose up so the plane doesn't ditch immediately but comes to a kind of a controlled crash. As a result, Jack and Dick are shaken up and bruised but otherwise unhurt. We see them scrambling out of the burning plane, looking at each other, stunned, telling each other, we're in a hell of a mess. They're surrounded by armed Chinese, one of whom dramatically, as if this were a movie, backhands Dick across the face. You can't make up this stuff, right? The young men are bound and taken to a local police station where Jack sees in the room the courier that they were supposed to pick up. This is the agent that Downey knew well and had trained. The courier looks at Jack, and he looks at the leading security officer there in his black leather jacket and gun. He nods, and the man says to Jack Downey, you are Jack. They'd been betrayed. 
At this point, the film would jump between what our heroes are going through in China, what is happening at the Far East base, and what's going on in Washington. The agent team on the ground radios back to the CIA uh, unit that the aerial pickup went fine. All's well. Plane should be back there by now. The plane, of course, is overdue. And after uh, air, land, and sea searches, the U.S. government comes up with a cover story that this is a cat commercial flight from Korea to Japan, that these two young men were civilian passengers employed by the Department of the Army, an important detail, and that the plane was believed to have crashed in the Sea of Japan. Back at the CIA unit, remember that junior officer who thought something was wrong with the radio transmissions? He's called back. And the unit chief tells him, we don't know what happened, and for security reasons, you need to keep your mouth shut. Don't mention this to anyone. He told me about it many years later. In Washington, the conclusion CIA came to was that the plane had crashed. Uh, or was shot down, but either way, there are no survivors. If there had been survivors, surely the Chinese would exploit that fact, another CIA mistake. What's for Hollywood not to like here? The, the families were informed and asked to keep secret their loved one's CIA affiliation. After a year, the men were declared dead. Insurance policies were paid out. Meanwhile, Jack and Dick are very much alive in Chinese custody. They wear leg irons for months. Food is sparse. They both lose a lot of weight. They're kept isolated from each other in small cells with some straw to sleep on and a light bulb constantly burning. The worst thing, of course, is that they are interrogated night and day, relentlessly. Their captors tell them, we know who you are. We know you are CIA. No one knows you're alive. And they won't know unless we tell them. Your imperialist government doesn't care about you anyway. You could well die here, so talk. Dick and Jack are immediately caught out in lies. They try to resist. But, for example, b before boarding the C-47, they were told as a cover story, by the way, if something goes wrong, say your cat employee's on a joyride. Now, you'll remember that the cover story, which is proclaimed to the world, is that they were Army civilians. Another screw-up. This doesn't help the men in the interrogations at all. It does also doesn't help that their CIA training made no provision for this kind of situation. Both men, in fact, have been told that if the communists ever capture you, you'll talk. Thanks, guys. Um, eventually, uh, isolated and frightened, both men do talk. They don't give away everything they know, but still they suffer a personally wrenching experience in confronting their own perceived weakness and guilt. In solitary confinement and subjected to abusive treatment, each man believes he's going mad. Now, over time, a lot of time, both men, each in his own way, uh, find ways of dealing with the hand dealt to them. So that much of the film, up to the announcement of Dick and Jack's conviction for espionage in 1954, when the Chinese finally trotted them out uh, in, a, in a public trial, this was the first time anyone knew they were alive. All this, up to this point, would take 30 or 40 minutes for a skillful um, Hollywood filmmaker. And we can see themes in the narrative so far that fit with how Hollywood likes to portray intelligence and CIA in particular. Mistakes, betrayals, hubris, more mistakes, and victims. When Hollywood says CIA, it wants you to think wreckage and wasted lives. Now, everything about this remarkable story is true. It's the rest of the story that could not be made according to Hollywood sensibilities as we've described them today. Dick Fecto ended up spending 19 years in Chinese prisons. Jack Downey, more than 20 years. Now, according to the cartoonish caricature of CIA, the CIA of the Good Shepherd, the CIA uh, certainly of Three Days of the Condor, uh, and the CIA of Spy Games, which actually had a Chinese prisoner element in it, CIA would have washed its hands of the matter. Sorry, we never heard of those guys. They, were, they knew their mission. They chose to accept it, and we disavow involvement. The reality, once more, is not just a little different. It's completely different. As soon as the agency realizes that Dick and Jack are alive, in fact, 
Uh, a committee is formed under no less than Richard Bissell to deal with the situation. Far from abandoning the men, Bissell's committee tries to find ways of getting them back. This is not a low-level rogue operation. This is Richard Bissell on the seventh floor, although there was no seventh floor at that time, but you, you get my drift. Um, but CIA runs into opposition from within the U.S. government and is rebuffed in its efforts. The agency finds itself alone in the government in trying to include Dick and Jack in the general release of Korean War prisoners. It is U.S. policy, not CIA, that insists on denying the truth of their activities and affiliation and which therefore seals the men's fate. So our movie would have to show a CIA that is constrained within the U.S. government, not a rogue, rogue element, uh, elephant. A CIA that can't do everything at once. But now, realizing that the men are going to be there for a while, a CIA that does everything it can to make it better. First of all, it restores them to the payroll. Then it begins graduated uh, promotions, uh, with the first promotions backdated, um, investing their accrued pay against the hope that someday they'd be able to use it. CIA gives them uh, hardship pay, which is understandable enough. Their duty station is a Chinese cell. But CIA, and I haven't decided whether this was actually illegal or not, CIA applies an equalization allowance, which is normally used for posts with high cost of living. Um, it's a stretch. But it allows the agency to transfer this money to the families to pay for monthly shipments, uh, once they're allowed, of extra food and vitamins. With regard to the families, CIA maintains frequent and regular contact with them by phone, mail, and in person for the entire period of their incarceration. Pays for their travel to China through cutouts uh, on the half dozen occasions when uh, travel is allowed, and even maintains allotments for them from the men's pay based on what we presume the men would want. For example, CIA officers visiting Dick Fecto's aging parents saw that they're struggling on a fixed income, increased the allotment from Dick's pay on the assumption that he would want that. Likewise for educational expenses for Dick's twins. Um, there was even a, uh, a court case where the agency uh, represented Dick's interests, uh, the court, court case invo involving the assets of his wife who died tragically in a fire. So this is not the bloodless, uncaring CIA of the Good Shepherd. Uh, a true-to-life movie would also deal with how Dick and Jack found ways of coping with a situation that, speaking at least for myself, I cannot imagine. I mean, if you restrict my motions for, you know, 20 minutes, I get upset, but 20 years? No, the agency training did not help them. It may have hurt them, but it is a testament to the kind of people who came to CIA during this period, and I would argue for the entire history, that these men survived through their wits, their humor, and their unrelenting faith that CIA was doing everything it could. Such a movie would show the abuse they suffered, yes, but also that they came through it not as victims. And this movie would have to show that this experience did not embitter them either, that they do not consider themselves heroes, and that they return to the agency as grateful men, though it has to be said that they didn't care to continue in intelligence work. Uh, Jack Downey was asked about it, and he said, you know, I don't think I'm cut out for this kind of work. <laughs> The agency made sure that even though technically they were short of retirement, I mean, you're 24-7 in Chinese prisons, but you're only counted for eight hours a day at work. Um, it, CIA is a bureaucracy and has to play by the bureaucratic rules, but we found ways of qualifying them for retirement. Um, they didn't have to go back to work for a single day. Uh, Jack Downey went uh, to school, to law school, and eventually became a respected judge in Connecticut. The J Judge John T. Downey uh, Juvenile Courthouse in New Haven is named for him. Dick uh, took care of his parents till their death. He went back to Boston University as its assistant athletic director. The last time the agency honored them was uh, almost 10 years ago when George Tennant presented them with the director's medal. At that occasion, Dick said, this is my outfit and always will be. And Jack declared, I am proud to be one of you. These are not victims. So contrary to the typical Hollywood view, um, not being victims, but rather somewhat, somewhat of a triumph of the human spirit, we live in a free country, you know, thank heaven. And Robert De Niro is free to make a movie like The Good Shepherd and even call it history. And 
Fortunately, others can say, no, it's not history, and can hate it and denounce it. I think, as uh, Dr. Johnson said, it is a false choice between historical fact and a good story for the silver screen. In the end, we can have both. For its part, the agency, though it's doing better in releasing some of these long secret true dramas, uh, it could do better still. Uh, for Hollywood's part, it would help if its producers and directors did a better job of respecting truth, the culture of truth, as a value in itself.